My name is Tyler Allen and my protein is penicillin binding protein 2A, abbreviated as PBP2A. So first we're just going to go over some of the structures of penicillin binding protein 2A. So in order to determine the primary structure, I was first able to use this unique nucleotide sequence provided by my professor. Um, I was able to use that in, and enter it into the NCBI nucleotide blast program. And, and doing this uh, provided me with the uh, corresponding DNA sequence. And from this DNA sequence, I was able to find the corresponding protein. Uh, where I was able to find the, the primary structure of my protein. So here we can see my associated protein off of the NCBI database. So we can see it is penicillin binding protein 2A, which is associated with the pathogen Staphylococcus aureus, or more specifically, methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, better known as MRSA. Below that, we can see our accession number for the protein and the associated gene, which is called the MECA gene. We'll be taking a look at that in a little bit. And right at the bottom here is our primary structure of our penicillin binding protein 2A. So it appears to be 668 residues. And from this primary structure, we can use this to help determine our secondary structure. So after obtaining the primary structure of penicillin binding protein 2A, I was able to use two secondary structure prediction programs to help me um, derive a secondary structure from this primary structure. So on this top line here, we can see uh, our primary structure from the previous slide and underneath these two are these two secondary structure prediction servers that were used to find the secondary structure so the CFSSP is our Chow and Fassman secondary structure prediction and our GOR4 is our GOR4 secondary structure prediction method so what these HCs and E's stand for, so our H stands for our helices, our E's represent our beta pleated sheets, our C's represent our coils, and our T's represent our turns. So what we have in yellow here is where our two secondary structure predictions agree and are, um, correspond with each other. And highlighted in blue is where our secondary structure corresponds and agrees with our tertiary structure. So we'll be taking a look at that in the next slide. So here we can see the tertiary structure of penicillin binding protein 2A. Um, on the left here, we can see an image of a predicted model of the tertiary structure that I created first using CPH models and then PyMol to help visualize it. Um, so that's the image you see here. And on the right, we can see the actual tertiary structure of PBP2A. So we can see that it's um, broken up into different domains. So up here we have our transpeptidase domain. Below that we have our allosteric domain. And then under that we have our N-terminal extension. So when talking about penicillin binding protein 2A, we're going to be primarily looking at the active site. So in the active site, there's a very important residue, um, residue 403, which is an active serine residue. And it's an, it's an active site that is important in the binding of um, these beta-lactam antibiotics and penicillins, and, um, and especially important in um, in MRSA and the ability to, to avoid binding to these um, beta-lactam antibiotics and leading to resistance. And also quickly we can just see our helices represented in red 
our coils represented in green and our uh, beta pleated sheets here uh, represented in yellow arrows. So now we're going to just discuss the normal function of penicillin binding proteins and the roles that they play. So penicillin binding proteins are also referred to as transpeptidases, are enzymes that help in the cross-linking of peptidoglycan strands. So peptidoglycan is a peptide polysaccharide layer um, seen in bacterial cell walls. So for me, uh, looking at MRSA, MRSA is a gram-positive bacteria, so it has that outer thicker layer of peptidoglycan compared to a gram-negative bacteria. So in our picture on the left, we can see that the peptidoglycan layer is made up of these alternating polymers of NAG and NAM, NAG being our um, N-acetylglucosamine and NAM being our N-acetylmuramic acid. And then above these, we have our chains of amino acids attached to these. Um, so, and then above this, we have our site of transpeptidation. So this is where the penicillin binding protein would cross-link these layers of peptidoglycan. So on the right here, we have our end product of them two now being cross-linked. And on the image on the right, we just have another way of showing uh, this transpeptidation occurring. So we have our uh, penicillin binding protein in green attaching these amino acids in red. Um, so um, on the image, our final product of our chains now being cross-linked and connecting our layers of peptidoglycan, providing that structure for the, for the cell. So since we know um, penicillin binding proteins are essential in cell wall formation of bacterial cells and ultimately the survival of the bacterial cell, um, we would want to try and target these penicillin binding proteins to prevent further formation of these peptidoglycan layers. So we have something called beta-lactam antibiotics that do just that. Um, so on our image to the right, we can see that we have our ring, our beta-lactam ring in pink, and it's attached to our penicillin binding protein. Um, and it's, it's inhibiting um, the penicillin binding protein from cross-linking um, the layers of the peptidoglycan. So it's, it's essentially destroying the um, cell wall of the bacteria. Um, so on the left, we have a few examples of some beta-lactam antibiotics. So we have penicillin, carbapenem, and cephalosporin. And as you can see, um, this peptide stem here on the left is, is very similar to these um, beta-lactam antibiotics, and that's purposeful. It's, it's attempting to mimic the structure and confuse the penicillin binding protein into um, binding to it. So now we're just going to talk about what is special about PBP2A and its role in MRSA. So PBP2A is important because it has a reduced or low affinity for beta-lactam antibiotics, which we saw in the previous slides that uh, are, these beta-lactam antibiotics are used to inhibit the cross-linking of these peptidoglycan layers in the cell wall. So for PBP2A, when these beta-lactam antibiotics are introduced, uh, the cross-linking is still able to continue and um, is basically essentially res resistant to these beta-lactam antibiotics because of that. And the main reason for this is that when we use penicillins that, um, that bind in regular penicillin binding proteins, they, these penicillins bind to the active serine site which is chemically active and then inactivates the enzyme. But in PBP2A, the active site is actually in a closed conformation. So it's almost hidden. Um, so these beta-lactams are unable to gain access to the site and therefore unable to um, inhibit the cross-linking from occurring. So PBP2A is encoded by the MEK-A gene, which is part of a 
large uh, mobile genetic element called SCC MEC, which is Staphylococcus chromosome cassette MEC. Um, so this MEC A gene is responsible for the expression of the PBP2A. So, so when they would, if they would want to test a, a staph strain uh, to, to determine if it was meth methicillin resistant or not, they would want to look for the presence of this MEC A gene. And you know, since this MEC A gene is responsible for the PBP2A, and which is therefore responsible for the resistance to these uh, beta lactam antibiotics, we'd want to know, you know, how did this Staphylococcus obtain this MEC A gene in the first place? Uh, so there are actually two hypotheses uh, that have ideas of how that occurred. So one is that it's called the single clone hypothesis, which suggests that the MEC A gene entered the Staphylococcus aureus population on one occasion and then resulted in the formation of a single MRSA clone, which then spread around the world. And another hypothesis that suggests that the MRSA strains evolved a number of times by means of horizontal transfer of the MEC A gene, which seems to make sense because this MEC A gene was detected in the previous lineages of the strain. So this does align with that hypothesis. So since that active serine site in PBP2A is in a closed conformation, uh, researchers are trying to examine the relationship to, between the active site and the allosteric site. Um, so they've noticed that when something like ceftaroline, uh, which is an antibiotic, is bound to the allosteric site, it actually causes conformational change in the active site. So the serine um, becomes more exposed in a better position to react to these beta-lactam antibiotics. So these are just ways that um, researchers are trying to um, play with this idea of opening or making this active site uh, more accessible. So I actually have a second-hand account of MRSA. Um, I recently spoke with one of my good friends, and I haven't spoke with them since the beginning of the year um, due to the pandemic. And we were talking, and he actually told me he recently contracted MRSA. Um, and this was from February 14th to February 21st. And I told him I was actually doing a... PowerPoint related to this and I asked him if he could send me some pictures to show his progression and get his opinion on uh, MRSA. So here from the first picture, um, as he explained it, he said that his finger became um, itchy and some redness developed. Um, so he initially had a tiny cut on his thumb before any of this happened. So that cut ended up becoming increasingly infected. Um, so we can see a little redness right here, a um, little sensitivity. And then as we move on, we can see this little picture um, right here. We can see his little cut on the tip of his thumb, which developed in with some pus formation inside of the wound. So this is when he realized that something was abnormal and he should have someone look at it. So he ended up going into urgent care and what they did, they, uh, they actually cut a little slice in near the wound and attempted to drain uh, the fluid and sort of clean it up. Uh, but they were still unsure at this point of what it was. So he went home and it ended up getting worse. So uh, he said, he explained to me by the 18th, the pain was almost unbearable. So he went into urgent care again, and they recommended that he see a hand specialist. So they ended up, um, before he went to the hand specialist, they ended up taking a sample and sending it to the labs and identified it as MRSA. So after that, after seeing, after visiting the hand specialist, um, he basically tried to, um, cut a hole into the infected area and sort of remove uh, where the MRSA was and where it was infecting. 
Um, but before this, right here, we can see when he went, they gave him um, an antibiotic called vancomycin intravenously. And this is an antibiotic that is used in um, for these cases. And he was telling me that you have to um, receive it in a slow manner or else it could cause something called red man syndrome which I never heard of um, but he was explaining that it's if, if it's given too quickly it can cause an anaphylactoid reaction which will cause like a, a rash in the face in the neck in the upper torso area and it's it's called red man syndrome so uh, luckily he that didn't happen to him but um, so yeah, so they tried. So next, they tried to cut out the infected area, and they ended up putting a wick in his thumb and wrapping it, as we can see in the next picture. And when they removed the bandage, he still had a pretty noticeable hole in the tip of his thumb. And after that healed he um he appeared to be feeling a little better and um so this is where his today um so this is what his thumb looks like now and i asked him how he felt now and he said he still has uh no feeling or sensation in some areas in his thumb um and i asked the pain baseline throughout throughout um his experience and you know he, he's a tough kid and he said it was an eight out of ten baseline but it was it was 10 out of 10 for him um, at times so he said it was the worst uh medical experience he's ever had um, so he gave me a little insight um, about his experience. Um, if you would like another account on someone that contracted MRSA, I have a video in the next slide that you can look at and check out, maybe learn a little more.